Dr. Dake, thank you very much for uh, joining us uh, this afternoon at the Feast Symposium. And um, was interesting. Let's go through a little bit about the presentation, uh, the scientific session on CCSVI. Um, I was struck with actually one of your last statements that you made in kind of the summary of the of the meeting, and that was we have to continue to study. We still don't have all the information, obviously. And um, so do you want to kind of expound on that sure. a little bit? Thanks, Sharon. I'd be uh -huh. happy to elaborate on it. Uh, at the VEAT Symposium this morning, we had a very, I think, interesting session. There were about eight or nine lectures on CCSVI, and uh, almost equally divided between proponents or supporters of of not only the theory but further study, not just for, for MS, but we were focused on MS uh, this morning, and those who basically discount it and uh, would like to see all effort stopped and think it's basically been decided that it is of no worth and we can't justify further expenditure. Uh, I think, you know, you always have to question yourself and look, make sure that you're not reacting in a defensive way, but I think most people look right down the center of the fairway and try and understand where we are and what's reasonable would have to agree that whether you're a believer or an absolute skeptic or in the majority of people agnostic we just don't know and I think that's important that the majority of people just need more information but I don't think that just saying this doesn't deserve further study is not acceptable to most people we may not know we're discovering things all the time we've been somewhat hamstrung by the fact that all of this is played out under a very bright light has been very inflammatory to traditional uh, you know, believers in, in the pathophysiology of MS as an autoimmune disease. And I'm not saying, and, and nor is anyone, that, that this shouldn't is right or wrong. It's just there are a lot of information out there that challenges some notions about uh, what we really believe. And I think that's natural. And I think you can't really just stuff the genie back in the bottle and say that after one randomized double-blind sham control study that had 30 patients yeah. that it's over because there are thousands and thousands of patients who again anecdotal as it is have had benefits in certain aspects of their disease certain symptoms that have improved and we just don't know why so I think really the the forward open-minded thinker has to understand that we have to go from that and try and, and now you're seeing I think a much more broader area of study talking about baroreceptor activation, talking about you know venous flow patterns and increasing cerebral perfusion, talking about all these different things. So we've sort of gone back to square one. And as I was saying today, it's kind of unfortunate that the term CCSVI has been sort of a lightning rod and has now just been stigmatized as this almost evil devil worshiper thing, you know. And so we're I think we're we're regrouping realizing that the next approach is going to have to be broader. It's not just going to be MS, it's really neurological it's disease. It's neurological disease. And we're going to have to be more open-minded, not so laser focused on just MS and treatment, but actually try and understand from square one what's going on and try to understand which patients may actually benefit, which features and what sort of characteristics could we identify non-invasively that would predict this patient will have a benefit from treatment and what features may be such that if they don't have them they may not benefit because we do have to admit that in the CCSVI group of MS we have a divergence of outcomes I think a lot of people and we and again we're lumpers rather than splitters and saying a lot of people have benefits but some don't benefit mm -hmm. but within the benefits there ranges as well and it's very, very difficult. But I just keep going back to the thought that the venous system throughout the body, all of the various vascular beds, whether it's the peripheral vasculature, the legs, whether it's the liver, whether it's the upper extremities, whatever it is, we certainly know that there are venous abnormalities that when you have them, and you have them to such an extent that you're at the margin of a 99% abnormality, so there are clinical consequences and symptoms that obviously are related to it. I firmly believe that's what we see here, you know? And in this spectrum, there's gonna be a group at the end of the day, a decade from now, that we're gonna identify that clearly will benefit from a treatment and improving their venous flow. Okay, um, so I think that that's kind of 
the promising future of CCSPIs. You just spoke to that. Um, I'm, I, we have just a little bit of time here. So also, um, this, uh, the International Society for Neurovascular Disease, ISNBD, you all are um, having your convention, your conference in Italy in March. And um, looking at the program, another great program it looks to me like. Yeah. Do you want to talk to a little bit about that? I'd be happy to, Sharon. The ISNVD annual program is in Naples in March. Uh, I think, again, you're seeing a broadening of the program. Uh, there was such, I think, intense interest fueled again by social media and, and patients who really were so hopeful about this in terms of CCSVI and MS. But now we're realizing it's broader that uh, if you have venous outflow obstruction, there may be, again, a range of various symptoms and a range of associations with other diseases, with other diseases. not just MS. Mm -hmm. So in the program, that reflects that. And again, uh, more basic science, because quite frankly, right now, basic science is, is where we live until such time that either the multi-center studies in Italy and Canada, Canada. can provide some basis for justifying going forward with larger clinical trials. Because right now, of course, no one is in the business of funding these clinical trials because we're sort of, um, until, you know, there's some So, and you're saying that we need to wait, really, until the... I'm not sure we need to wait, but in order to be practically speaking, in order to get funding for that, we're yeah, going to have I to understand. have, okay. you know, I wish we could do the trials we want to do now, but in terms of who would pay for those trials and how we would do it, that is, again, a very difficult situation in the current environment. More trials come out. Uh, again, the, and I think what you heard this morning from both Dr. McCann in terms of the uh, British Columbia okay. study and Dr. Zamboni in terms of the Italian study, that we're probably looking at those trials ending up sometime next year with results to be uh, uh, presented probably in the first part of 2016. So that's what everyone has a great deal of interest in and to an idea a great deal of hope because that will probably direct to some degree what, what happens the in the future. Is, what's going to happen in the future. Okay. Um, there were, um, as you mentioned, there was um, a few negative remarks about CCSPI and um, I would, um, looking at at the remarks that were made, I just would like to state that as a patient, that um, you know, people with MS, if they lose five years of their life or 10 years of their life, they can't gain that back. It's gone. So these randomized controlled trials, if something is proved safe, then as a patient, and many patients don't understand why we cannot have the procedure. So do you want to speak to that a little bit? And maybe that's too Well, general. I think that, uh that's a very good point. I think someone from the audience brought up, brought up a very uh, a corollary point that in when we do these trials, patient selection is key. Mm -hmm. The more we open our shutters up to all sorts of people coming in, the less we're going to be able to make sense of it. So ideally, if we can pick patients that we think are sort of similar in their symptoms, their degree of disease, other things, and try and get a group that I think captures, I think, the sweet spot and is not so heterogeneous like having uh, EDSS's way out as opposed to sort of in the mid to lower range, mm -hmm. I, think, I think we'll be better off. Now, back to why can't we have this done, well again, it's, it's something that is, uh, uh, there are many issues, not only economic issues, which is the obvious one, and patients would have to pay for this as obviously no insurance or no government agency is currently willing to to, to do the study. reimburse for this. So that makes it difficult because then we're selecting out the haves and the have-nots and no one feels good about that. Now let's be so and I think what we all would like to see and would hope that we could funnel people into trials so everyone can benefit from that experience. If we just do people who have the money to pay for the to have it done, we're going to lose a valuable opportunity to capture them in a controlled study mm -hmm. in a way that really, I think, uh, um, has the potential to lead us forward in a positive way. Um, one other thing, um, I, looking at my notes here, and this was interesting to me, that one of the gentlemen um, 
and his presentation, he was talking about a double balloon oh, yeah. using. Um, I've never heard of that. That had that. Was well, this I, I didn't really. I, he showed a number of things, including a balloon next to a wire, which would be sort of a larger cutting balloon cutting balloons, and I want to get into specifics, no, I can yeah. only go beyond a certain diameter, and many of these veins are larger than that. But he was creating sort of his own homemade cutting balloon by putting a wire next to the balloon, and the balloon was of an appropriate size to push the wire. There's no idea, Sharon, if that works or not. Okay. The double balloon is obviously uh, in certain situations where you... Uh, Again, don't want to get technical, but the larger a balloon is, the less pressure it can exert on the wall. Okay, so balloons that are 14 or 16 millimeters don't have the same capacity mm -hmm. uh, to exert pressure on the wall that a smaller balloon is. The smaller balloons can take much higher pressure. So if I need a bigger diameter, but that bigger diameter balloon is not capable of dilating, by putting two smaller balloons in, I may allow it to make higher pressure at a diameter that's okay. more appropriate. For Interesting. Thank you for answering that for me. Okay. Um, I don't think, I think we've kind of covered everything. Um, I know that um, both of us are kind of on a time limit here. So well, anything else that you no, have? No, it's been my pleasure. I'm still uh, very interested in this, as you know. Yes, we, I know. We, we sort of, I think, uh, would, would just all like to see more progress so that when we talk about this, we can have a much more robust instead of rehashing old arguments and talking about old things. And I think we all are just so thirsty for new Well, data. and I think that patience now that we understand too that we were probably one of the faults too, that there was too much. We brought up a lot of the discussion with the social oh, media. Oh, that's no one. I mean, this is, I think this will go down in history when we look back. Maybe we'll now. be pioneers. Well, we'll be pioneers, <laughs> but I think what you'll see is that this is the first time that something was played out in such an immediate public eye. Uh -huh. In other words, anything that was done was posted on this blog or that social media outlet, and nothing could really... It created a, an artificial situation where we weren't able to work through some of the issues like we normally might because if someone had this response or that response, it got fueled and inflamed into this giant thing, you yes. know, and in reality, no other device or no other procedure has ever undergone that sort of, you know, sort of real-time, you know. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah. Thanks very okay. much, Sharon. Thank you. Uh-huh.